watching MX24, your home as usual for fun, fearless and factual information. This is Spotlight, the current affairs edition, and I, I am Noam Falong. Today we are still discussing governance, and on our seat we have a man who is an astute politician. He is also the minority leader in parliament and the member of parliament for Tamale South. Before we move into the discussion, we're going to go for a quick commercial break. When we come back, I'll take you straight to our guest. Stay with us. I am Nuong Falong. I have on the seat today Honorable Haruna Idrisu. He's a minority leader in parliament. He's also a long-standing politician. And I'm going to be speaking with him about certain issues concerning governance, especially leading into the 2020 elections. Honorable, welcome. Yeah, Falong, my pleasure. And uh, thank you for joining us. It's good to be talking to you this uh, evening and I believe to be discussing matters that uh, generally improves the governance regime of our country for the good of the Ghanaian uh, people. All we do is to improve the quality of life of the Ghanaian. I'm not too satisfied with the performance of our institutions, including parliament itself. I've said that the day the Parliament of Ghana will elevate itself above being a clearing house for executive embarrassment, then the Parliament will be serving the people of Ghana better because we do not scrutinize uh, bills as good as we should. We do not demand value for money as best as we should. Oh, no, but are there specific uh, incidences you want to point to? Yes, when you have... Uh, Parliament, for instance, recently we approved 290 million U.S. dollars under Article 1771 of the Constitution for the Minister of Finance to have access to money from the Contingency Fund, from the Stabilization Fund, for purpose of dealing with COVID as a public health emergency. Now, if you read Article 1771, it comes with a two. Okay. It says that having taken the money, the minister must come back to parliament under article 1772 account. not account provide a supplementary estimate how he intends to pay back the money we saw minister of finance ken Furata appear before parliament with his own supplementary budget for the 2020 financial year nothing nothing absolutely nothing was said about this 290 million us dollars but is there a timeline which works Maybe out to about 1 billion the constitution uses the word as soon as possible okay. uh, so as soon as possible even interpreted by his word at least between the period he took the money and when he came back with a supplementary estimate there's a duty imposed on him for accounting for it 
There is more even to COVID. I don't think that it's worth celebrating yet. Honorable. You saw America and you saw Europe uh, say that they were declined in their numbers. Yes. We've seen spikes in their numbers. And therefore, this is not the time to say hooray, hooray to COVID. Uh, but a lot of people have commended government for proper management of the COVID <laughs> crisis. You uh, don't share with proper this management. Way. When you didn't do adequate testing, you call that proper management. We didn't do proper monitoring, and therefore we didn't do proper isolation. It's probably the case that many of us may be walking about COVID infected, even without knowing, because the opportunity to determine it hasn't been uh, provided. Yes, the number of now, deaths. You see, they can't test random the people. The it's number based of, on uh, the, the, the number of you know people who show up with symptoms. Are you in, in, are you in Italy or Spain? They tested even in the United Kingdom. They didn't follow your path. So if you are happy with what government is doing. Essentially, I'm not. You cannot compel me to go well, with no, your I'm thinking. Not you. I just and want I'm to saying understand. that in the United Kingdom, a lot of test uh, kits were bought. And even in Ghana, you should be worried about government exploiting Ghanaian travelers coming from abroad. What's this charge of $150 per person arriving in Ghana? For what? You don't. Government is not set up to make profit. Do you think the testing <laughs> should be done? I for say free? government is not a profit-making entity. I'm not saying for free. When you make $150 per person, for what purpose? In any case, that is illegal, which is a law backing the charges or those fees. You know any law? We have the Fees and Charges Act. There is no legal regime or framework that mandates and authorizes government to take that money. So, but my concern is that in the name of managing a public health emergency, you don't profit out of it. I think it's important government comes properly to you parliament. Think government is one to get from the a legal authorization for the charges of those fees, and two for us to find a way to dedicate the money. If we want to use it for public health emergency purposes or isolate it to build some COVID clinic or buy COVID uh, PPEs, we would support it. But you In don't. The absence of that, you think it's You don't rule a country capriciously as and when you just decide to do something. There's anybody arriving at the airport must pay 150. What happens to those Ghanaian nationals who are coming in from abroad who do not, with their children, have 150,000 US dollars on them? What happens yeah, to them? US dollars. That's a lot of money. I'm sure you've not labored on the streets of uh, New York or London to know how much it takes to earn a $150. For them, it means a lot for them and it means a lot for their savings. Even as you still discuss COVID, I'm currently reviewing a paper. You remember that on the 5th of April, the president announced 350000 for health service frontline workers and others mm -hmm. for insurance. You should be interested in who the contract went to. I hear it went oh, to yeah. Enterprise Insurance and they did a memo around 20th April for 10.3 million Ghana cities. I mean, this conflict of interest situation in Ghana must be checked because it is a veritable source of corruption and abuse of office. I've just seen a memo of APL uh, which arranged a facility demanding 2 million. But see the speed. The insurance cover was announced on the 5th of April. Yet the Minister for, fin uh, the Minister for Health by a letter dated 28th March, had already committed 10.3 million to insurance. When, when you say APL demanded 2 million, is this 2 million cities or 2 million? Yeah, 2 million Ghana cities. But be interested in 28th, we see a letter of the Minister for Health, Honorable uh, Ajima Menu, asking for a lease of 10.3 million, 28th March. The President announces on 5th April an insurance cover of 350, which was accumulating to 10.3 million. Then we now see payment being demanded by enterprise uh, insurance. That's a clear case of conflict of interest. Again, profiting out of COVID and the public health emergency. Generally, as a country, we should commend ourselves. I won't take that way away from the sleeves of government. Mm -hmm. But thanks to all of us, we've been religiously disciplined in wearing the masks, in isolating. I have not gone to my mocks for a very long time because I needed to respect COVID uh, protocols. And even if you stood by me, I insist that you had a mask on. And we and still have borders closed. Uh, uh, borders Land closed. Borders. Uh, but there's now air borders. I'm not sure that. We are just lucky that maybe the humidity of our society itself is not tolerant of COVID. I'm beginning to explain 
by my own uh, assumption that yeah, the spikes in the numbers in both Europe and America is a transition to winter and the weather of okay. a cold weather. Naturally, people will develop flu around this period and the infection can take advantage of it. But what we are saying is government has taken a lot in the name of COVID. We're told that about 2% of our GDP, you saw the 1 billion US dollars come in from the uh, World Bank Rapid yes. Credit Facility. You've got another 1 billion in the 290 million. And then again, they've borrowed from the Bank of Ghana without parliamentary approval. That is not right constitutionally and in law. The laws provide, even the Bank of Ghana Act, you cannot borrow more than 10% uh, of previous government revenue. Total government revenue at the time uh, amounted to government borrowed about 10 billion. That's about 20% of the borrowing. Is it an unexpected pandemic. So you borrow. So when you have a pandemic, you sell all your property and tell your children that they can look up to a pandemic. Oh, no, but what if we tomorrow? have a situation where uh, government <laughs> is able to actually account for all these monies that you mentioned? You see, you don't you come to parliament to... and account with wholesale numbers when you say PP is 260 million. Tell us what PPs are you buying? Is it you max? You want figures. You Absolutely. want descriptions. Retail, retail numbers, and on which hospital? How much are you spending? On Ministry of Health, how much are you spending? Then I can compare the max the gentleman is wearing to a max produced in Kenya, a max produced in Uganda, and a max produced in U a UK. So you can when I get the, the unit price, I can demand value for money for the Ghanaian people that there is prudent and efficient use of public resources for our purposes. I think that the World Health Organization itself nearly filled the world when it took them a longer time to so declare so COVID as a public health uh, emergency. We are not there yet. I mean, if you look at Brazil, the United Kingdom, and the US, USA, you certainly will not be happy with the numbers in terms of COVID uh, infections and the deaths arising out of it. Compared to Ghana, we are heaven. Honorable, uh, let's look at unemployment in Ghana. Presently, unemployment stands at 4.51%. This is an increase. It's up from 2018, it's up from 2019. You used to be You used to it's up from 2016, say so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You used to be an employment minister, in your opinion. <laughs> How can we reduce unemployment figures in Ghana? Uh, I've always maintained that my best portfolio in public service was to be the Minister for Employment. And I've further maintained very strongly that in my view, employment is a best measure of living standards than the economy's per capita income GDP. I don't believe in theoretical economics. If anybody has a job, that person is likely to be able to feed himself and the family. And therefore, employment is as important as any opportunity that must be offered Ghanaian. Indeed, our quest to improve the performance of the economy must be one which is intended to create opportunities of employment. Now, note that the public sector is not the largest employer. In Ghana, the employer is the private sector. The private sector is what we describe as the incubator of jobs. So what government does is to provide an enabling environment for the private sector to be able to create those uh, opportunities. Sure. Now, unemployment as a crisis, I maintain even far back in 2015 and 2016 that it's a national security crisis and a ticking time bomb that we have to be very careful when you would have an arrow spring in Ghana. How do we address, to address that crisis? Out of, <laughs> government must manage the economy better and provide opportunity. But let me interrogate your numbers. Ghana doesn't have accurate, reliable statistical data on well, employment. Well, so far. That's a worry. I tried when I was Minister for Employment to develop what we call the Labor Market Information System, LMIS, so that you develop the portal across the country. Any person wanting a job can go on to it, apply for a job. We have the profile of person. And then don't confuse it. In Ghana, you have two categories of unemployed persons. And I think that in Ghana, there is a, a certain aspect of employment we are taking for granted. Which is Some of our persons are just not employable.
Okay. They don't have the they basic have the skills, education. skills to be employed. So should we rather then you that? must deal with informal sector unemployment. And the formal sector unemployment, unemployment, which deals with university graduates, polytechnic graduates, and all of them. If you have a public sector, for instance, you've had Dr. Mahmoud Baumia and the Minister of Finance, uh, they have been economical with numbers when they say that they have created 350,000 jobs. That can never, ever be true in Ghana. Why you inherited a public sector with a population of 686,000. If you added 380,000, you are talking of a million. Go to the budget statement for 2017, 2018, 2019. And in those figures, even adding NAPCO 100,000, you can't call that category of people as expanding public sector employment. These are workers you don't even pay uh, SNIT for. You think uh, you are, they are not properly trained, they are not paid commensurate salary for what they do. So when you say you've created 330 public sector jobs, where are those jobs? And where is the sincerity in terms of those uh, jobs? We had, for instance, government say that, um, I hope you are interested in it, if you have a government promise that they'll spend $1 million per constituency, I'm MP for Tamale South. So take it at the Dr. Baumia exchange rate, 5.2%, not Haruna or Ghana market rate of 5.8%, 5.5, 5.7. Now, it m means that if government was sincere, and that's what the Dagombe said, that when you build a house with saliva, dew collapses the house because you are insincere in getting the house uh, built. It meant that 5 million Ghana cities would have been spent in my constituency. So show me whether Swami, Nadoli, or is Kali or Garu, or Binduri, or is Boku, or is Boda. It unaccounted for, Show opinion? me 5 million spent each year. Extended That's insincerity. So 5 million times 3 years should work out to 15 million Ghana cities. You don't come and build a KVIP toilet worth 300, 400,000 and say that you have honored your word on $1 million per constituency. You don't go and construct that cattle dam or a duck out and say that you spend one million dollar per constituency. In any case, even those of you in the media, you must interrogate the MPP further. If you read their manifesto well, they said they were going to double digit grow the economy. The economy has never grown double digit, whether 2017, 18, 19, or 2020. Now we may have a crisis. Which crisis may be that this year the deficit is likely to be over 14 percent? Excluding what the Minister of Finance has cleverly put as his expenditure profile footnotes. You see, when you spend money on the banking sector crisis and decide not to add it to public expenditure, who are you deceiving? Because that is public expenditure. So once you get the deficit numbers wrong, you are likely to be parading good numbers of your GDP, uh, GDP to deficit ratio, tax ratio, even inflation, you are likely to get the calculation wrong. So what they are doing cleverly is to keep the numbers. So this government is guilty of two important things. One, accumulating areas. So they are not adding on to the areas as if there is discipline. But you know that, Odika, you know, when you have areas, it means there is some money you should pay. Then two, they spend on the banking sector crisis. But even that, uh, Ghanaian should thank Excellency John Dramani Mahama, if he hadn't pledged in the NDC manifesto that when he comes, within one year, he'll clear the banking sector debt. I'm not sure that Nana Dudanko would have been paying the associated debt associated with the banking sector crisis. Because he came to parliament. Do you think that action no. is because the NDC? Oh, made... there is fact. When he came to parliament, they said they were going to pay some 20, uh, 80%, and 20% will be rolled back to 2025. Are we in 2025? And why are they rushing to do it? Because they think that conveniently now they can add that to the COVID expenditure. That's not COVID. You have a banking sector crisis expenditure. They must be bold to add it to public expenditure. And we know that they are ballooning the deficit. So Ghana is almost among eight African countries which has been uh, described as possible debt distressed countries. We are spending a lot of money in servicing debt, about 21 billion Ghana cities uh, per year. This is problem you that's have, not exclusive. You have government borrow from Bank of Ghana. The NDC government did not borrow from the Bank of Ghana. So don't say it's an old problem. If you have evidence that between 2014, 15, and 16, government borrowed from the Bank of Ghana, share with me. I mean borrowing in general. 
and I say borrowing, we can tell Narrow, you what we borrow If you're narrowing down for. to the bank of Canada. <laughs> yeah, yes. If you go into borrowing, then you must go full. At the time that the NDC left office, Excellency John Dramani Mahama and the NDC left a public debt of 120 billion Ghana cities. If you want 122 billion, because the MPP calls 122, Auditor General calls 120. Today, our public debt is sitting as 263 billion Ghana cities. Partly due to the rebasing of the economy. No, rebasing rather should give them an advantage. So you are getting it wrong. This is even with a rebased economy. With a rebased economy, the debt, 120, you've added over 140 billion within three and a half years. And you say you are prudent or superior management of the economy or better managers of the economy. Which economy? So Dr. Mahmoud Bawen and Adankwa must come clear with the Ghanaian people that they are hiding some of the numbers. You know even the deficit they declared that they got 4%. The IMF contradicted them that the deficit, in fact, for 2019 was not less than 7%. And, and they said it was addition mistake. of energy. It's not deliberate. It's deliberate deception so that Ghanaians will not be able to compute the debt to GDP ratio well. Oh, no, well. Let's go to Parliament. They said they were going to end suffering. Our teachers not suffering, our nurses not suffering, our workers yeah, not suffering. Some, they were Has suffering that ended? And under suffering the previous increased. government, there was also some our amount suffering of suffering. Increased. Oh, but they said they wanted to end it. Have we seen a terminal case? But these are political promises. Now come to Parliament. That What's we happening? have heard from What's both parties. What's happening to Parliament? Yes, we we'll hear you. Honorable, oh, was there no suffering under the NDC? But someone promised to end the suffering. And if you are sitting up. Are you no, not I, promising I to end the I suffering say, of Ghanaians? I say, if you are sitting up, and then. Oh, no, but you're, you're, you're seeking re election in 2020. Yep. One of the promises should be to improve the lives of Ghanaians. Is there no promise? To <laughs> generation, end generation of employment and improvement in the quality of infrastructure. What? I think that there is still a major deficit and concern with poor road, poor road network in the country. When you talk about employment, I travel from Bibiani to Sefi. We are so through Sefia, we so and the uh, road network. The road network was not good enough. Yes, but, so we uh, need to but the NDC it. prides itself over infrastructural development, especially in 2016. Our, we did our part, and okay. you can see some of the infrastructure. Your part was not enough. You see Tema, the expansion of the infrastructure, see the Takuradi Habo, see educational infrastructure, was that an over see IT infrastructure. Okay. I've heard Dr. Bamuya talk about internet to universities. It started under the NDC. You can find out. I think at the time, Professor Ellis was vice chancellor for the University of Science and Technology, Kwame Nkrumah, when we extended some Huawei intervention to support the KNUST and the UGS in Tamale. I remember taking but even a personal But continuing is a good thing because it's, it's government that continues. And so don't continue. come and claim credit for it. You've seen airport. The terminal tray is one good example of superior debt management. It's not sitting on the public debt of Ghana. That's superior thinking. It's sitting on the airport tax that they, that, 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 that they, 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 they get. So we're on, and uh, Fufusu Road was done under NDC. Right. Accra Regional Hospital, which improved access to quality health care by workers within the civil and public service as part of debt. Uh, the regional hospital in Bolga Tanga and the uh, Upper East and in Upper West region were all part of uh, debt. Rural electrification, which expanded access to over 5,000 communities, okay. bringing the numbers to about 72 percent or 80 percent of national coverage. So we are, have a proud record in terms of our intervention for infrastructure Infrast development okay. in Ghana. You have That's a why record, President which is not 100% is ready in the day to debate uh, the running away in Nana Kufuado in terms of uh, debate on the issues. Let's go back to unemployment. You mentioned the improvement in uh, unemployment, increasing employment. What new thing are you going to introduce? I think I've just read a report from the World Bank about worrying underemployment in Ghana. And that's why I said that uh, employability is important and we need to equip many of our young people with employable skills. That's why it's where the government so is investing on the human capital in technical vocational education. You know, sometimes you all get it wrong. When Nana Dudangwa says that free senior high school, when you wake him up, that's why he celebrates. I mean, just ask yourself, could free senior high school be possible? without education infrastructure of classroom, 
and uh, accommodation for students. After all, the students are not sitting on trays. So he must credit somebody, and he must credit the NDC that, based on their earlier interventions, his intervention appears successful. Basic, basic. But it, like the, they're, they're building two, upon, which you will two, also do when you are in then power. Then two, investment in it. The NDC have promised in our manifesto to expand access to free senior high school, to include private schools. We simply are saying that rice and its enjoyment are not divisible. The right given any Ghanaian citizen is regardless whether you are in a public school or a private school. So we are enhancing the frontiers of the beneficiaries of free senior high school. The NDC did not say that free senior high school was practically impossible forever. We what said they... that build infrastructure first. That's why President Mahama at the time then initiated the e-block so that there was accommodation to absorb them. You don't have these traffic lights of red, blue, green lights of tracking system and then you get in many of the young girls impregnated at home. Are you happy about but, that? Well, there's you should no go data to the girl to child education exactly unit and get the statistics, very worrying statistics of young girls getting impregnated and out of school arising out of the tracking no, no, system. We're so discussing human capital improvement. Yeah, human capital. For My worry is that we may end up investing in numeracy and literacy and not human capital. It's early yet. Give yourself five, ten years, you come to appreciate uh, the How debate. How do you think that's I'm going to, to, to affect uh, the improvement in human capital? Between 1997 and yesterday, I've not seen SSS graduate more than 52% move to the tertiary level. So many of them will end at the level of that investment in just basic literacy and numeracy. That may not be good enough for the future Which of the country. Which is better than nothing. In terms of our company. It's better than being illiterate, but yes. not better than nothing. You have an educated well, you would population. Rather choose to be it's always a good to thing the SS to do. Point and I say, but don't say you have educated people, human capital, when you are just investing in Shushan boys, so to speak. Yeah. Right, <laughs> honourable. <laughs> so we're looking at your improvement in human capital, and you've talked about. And education. I say that there'll be investment in education. There'll be investment in health, and there will be opportunities for specific? employment. With, yeah, specific there aspects is, of education there that we should is. be looking at. I think at. that light manufacturing industry, we need to look at it again, come to government, 1G, 1F. What they have done is to come to parliament and be granting tax exemption left, right, center to their friends, not to people who really have industrial acumen and entrepreneurship, who want to contribute to the growth of our economy and to address increasing unemployment in our country. They need to get it right. The concept itself is good enough. Uh, rural, small-scale industrialization taken away. But you remember, when you were studying economics, if you did, you cited an industry based on proximity to raw materials, mm -hmm. proximity to market, access to raw materials. Yes. Is that being considered today? So you don't come putting tax of 1G1F on factories in Accra and Kumasi and say that you've constructed 1G1F uh, factories across the country. It was to deal with local specific industrial challenges. You go to Wale Wale or Bungpurugu, what do they have a comparative advantage at? Then you use industry to help them in order to generate jobs. So there are some of the jobs, for instance, and I, I am determined to support Excellency John Mahama to do it tomorrow. If you take the Brown Half region, they have interest and specialization in cashew and poultry. Right. Develop that industry for them as a region. And invest in cashew, invest in poultry, and their young people will be happy with you. They have an economic activity to be able to feed themselves. Honorable, we're going to take a break And here. then you take the Upper East and Upper West industry, look at cotton. The cotton industry is dead. Look at our garment and textiles industry, they are all gone. Whether it's Akusumbo textile or it's Japan textile or it's even a uh, Balogu factory. And some even of those textiles we're region. folding up in the years leading I, up I to I agree with you, NDP. but you are the same person talking about unemployment. I mean, if you had a textile industry employing 7,000, now employing 700, you don't have sleeplessness, then you, have, you must have a problem. Oh, no, but we'll be right back to... to... Thank you. Yeah, uh, you're still so tuned into MX24.
We were speaking with Honorable Haruna Idris, with the Minority Leader in Parliament. We have been discussing governance as a whole. We have touched on unemployment. We've touched on uh, coronavirus management. Uh, we're going to go for a quick break. When we come back, we'll be moving into some aspects of Parliament. Stay with us. <music> No, this is not business as usual. This is a different kind of business. From the global stock market, to our central bank, to insights on insurance and investment, Spotlight is a show for you. Here, we look beyond the numbers. On Spotlight, we'll tell you the complexity behind the figures. On Spotlight, we examine hardcore financial issues. Join me, Philip Nanfuri, on MX24, together with policymakers and experts as we talk business. MX24. This is Spotlight, the current affairs edition. I am Nuong Falong. I bring you Spotlight on Mondays and Wednesdays at 8.30 p.m. Honorable, before we went on the break, we, you know, we spoke about unemployment. Uh, you have often made comments about the high attrition rate in Parliament. Um, what, how do you think this can be approached? What is the solution? Regrettably, our uh, democracy, as you saw in the last MPP primaries, is now reserved for the highest bidder. He who pays more gets a nod. Is this because of the high filing fees? It does not to your... say that the NDC does not also suffer. Generally, we should be looking at the two twin evils. Vigilantism as a threat to our democracy and monetization as a threat to our democracy. We have a the vigilantism bill now. Common, it doesn't give you any comfort. We have even, we have even a, a vigilantism act, not a bill. But you see a minister shooting at the polling station, reduce herself to a vigilante. What happened? Was a law existing or not? And is the law is meant for some good you, you person somewhere. You think Honorable Kumsen re reduced herself to a vigilante? When you shoot at the polling station, what are you? You think that ministers, why do they give you a bodyguard? And if you have an objection at the polling station, do you shoot? You're not satisfied the with law, how the issue was resolved? The law pro provides for how grievances are to be managed. That's how you ensure sanity and civility in a society. We've seen vigilantes even raid courts. What happened to them? We've seen vigilantes chase ministers and MPs of their ruling new patriotic party. What happened to them? So don't make a mockery of us as if the law was meant only for political opponents. The fundamental principle of the rule of law is equality of the law. Let not the law know some and not know others. You don't select and you are not selective in the application of the law. So attrition is largely because one parliament itself has invested hugely in training members of parliament, but it's not able to protect them. We are exposed to the competitive democratic politics of the political parties, which regrettably is Isn't that an advantage of democracy? What advantage? Competition for, you know, the best person to win the seat. Let the people Democracy choose. is just encouraging and facilitating corruption in Ghana. Where do the money come from? Where the MPs get the money to buy the votes? Where does it come from? And we must be interested in it in the What's the solution? Shouldn't we elect them? Uh, what's, the, what's the solution? I think that the political parties must review the selection process of members of parliament. For instance, what's if I'm a minority now? leader or majority leader, I should be able to say that I need this caliber of MPs. I mean, imagine me working in parliament tomorrow without the Honorable Yile Chire, Honorable Inusa Fusene. These are very experienced as so you when think the parties should choose the legislation. MPs? They are thorough and they are deep and they've stated the subject matter. So it's not just about replacing the member of parliament. You must replace him with something that is qualitative. But I agree with you that it's a consequence of competitive adversarial but, democratic But you know, if you're being overly selective, uh, you're, you're also denying new entrants the opportunity to come in. Through but a new entrants, you be interested in parliament where we are. Very soon, we'll move to consideration stage of law. He will tell you. But you were all once Less new. Less than five, ten MPs are interested in it. 
Oh, interestingly, from the very day I entered Parliament, I sought to learn and took particular interest. Yes, in but what if someone drafting. had said the same thing? You know, what? It's one thing saying it and acting it. I'm saying that I acted it. I mean, thanks to the late Norbert Awule, I learned a lot from him in terms of drafting. And I'm a better uh, lawmaker today, thanks to his uh, primary tutelage. So, your opinion, what do we do? Uh, so we, what's wrong with the primaries? We, we just rule out primaries and select. No, I on... say political parties, there must be reform. And maybe we should go back to the state itself coming in to support political parties with state financing of their parties and their processes. Maybe we should resurrect it. Even today, none of you is talking about incumbency and the abuse and exploitation of incumbency by Nana Adudankwa. That's not right. When you use the word elections, I had a journalist ask a question at an NDC press conference. I was wondering what kind of death the journalists have. The word free, free, when they say elections are free and fair, uh, it's not that Okota dia men be to so. The word free there, it means the elections must be free from fear, free from intimidation, free from tagri, Ghana's free from violence. Ghana's elections have been consistently touted as that. one of the, the freest within <laughs> okay. the, the sub region. If you say you don't so, agree? If you say so, that, no. We remain a beacon of hope, undoubtedly. Our democracy is growing, and we need to deepen the ethos and values of our democracy. So when you say abuse but of incumbency, exactly what are you We are still not there yet. If you don't see abuse of incumbency, uh, I don't see it too. Well, you, you, if you mention it, you have to give me specifics. And you are in the media landscape of Ghana, you don't see abuses? I, I'm not the one being interviewed. When a political party uses state resources, to his advantage, that's an incumbency. How, how has the NPP done that? We must separate the NPP as a political party from the government of Ghana mm. to allow for fairness. That's why Article 162 and further to it imposes an obligation on you, the media people, to give free, equal, and fair opportunity to all political parties. We do that. Look at, look at, <laughs> we're here interviewing you, you're in the opposition. I have to monitor equal. how. I have to monitor during your news how many slides you give to the ruling government against what you've given me to measure you. So it's not enough interviewing me. The words are that free and equitable access. I think most uh, journalists, to, that to the best of their ability... Go and resurrect the debate on incumbency. In our newsrooms. Uh, we'll, in the we'll, Ghanaian public we'll do that. space. Since, since yeah. you're speaking about elections, uh, as early as last month, Mm -hmm. You accuse the EC of being disrespectful to... To the law? Yes. Uh, what did you mean? The EC doesn't behave to me, Haruna. I just say that the Electoral Commission is an institution governed by law, created under Article 45, the CI 127, and the CI which governs the election. You see them use the words provisional voter register and certified voter register. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that they must provide clarity. If you are giving political parties a copy of the voter register, what copy are you giving them? A certified copy or a provisional register. Do it in accordance with law. This electoral commissioner doesn't respect political parties. But in my view, as a student of political science, there's no electoral commission without political parties. What's, what's she done to show she doesn't respect <laughs> it's the political only, parties? It's only democracies that have parliaments. And it's only democracies that have accountable governance that periodically we account to the people that we are doing. The president doesn't have the power forever. Members of parliament don't have the power forever. Every other four years, we must go back to the people for a renewal of our mandate. I'm running for re-election as member of parliament in Tamale South. That's political accountability. I've had even political science lecturers take on MPs that MPs should not promise. What political science? Oh, no, but you know MPs MPs have a defined role, mm -hmm. representative of the people. Okay. In a representative capacity, we are advocates for the good cause of the people and for the public good of the You're people. You're very much like journalists. You're also to advocates say, good. for good So government. to say that I would advocate for government to construct a road or a hospital is not misplaced. It's part of our representative role as members of parliament. We have investigative oversight role, which we are not using. Parliament is not helping the fight against corruption. We ourselves are aiding it 
by some of our inactions and acts of commissions on the floor of parliament. There is no diligence. You bring one billion US dollar, you want it approved over a 24 hour period. What opportunity are you giving me to interrogate the numbers Honorable, and to demand value for money? We're talking about the EC. And the uh, so the electoral parties. commission is law. And Don't talk as if they've disrespected agreed. me as Haruna. Yes, I I'm agree. Saying that to, to, you, to, you said to political parties. No, get it right. The EC must conduct its business with fidelity to the law. Nothing agreed. More. But someone would say that most of these accusations wouldn't exist if she had been uh, appointed under the NDC. Oh, no. Why? Were you not in Ghana when Charlotte was appointed and then this? Didn't you hear them? Well, simply so saying is it a that, retaliation? No, not at all. Not at all. I mean, if you came for a budget, the EC came for budget to procure 75,000 BVGs. Where are they? You must be demanding that. I, I sit in the committee as vice chair, and then you people mix up verification of register with uh, register. There were BVRs. Those are biometric voter registration, uh, registration devices. There must be BVGs, verification devices. And this is your opportunity to test it, not on election day. I promise you, Ghana is more likely to see the use of a manual system of voting on 7th December against what has been promised. We didn't promise. They said they were bringing even facial recognition. Have you studied facial recognition very well? I had a setting up a committee to clean up the register. Where you have a properly installed facial recognition software, it naturally will detect double faces. When you introduce a facial recognition software, it will go into the manuscripts to eliminate. Uh, if you see a Haruna face double, the computer will tell you that this face has been picked up double. But you don't come with a charade and come and call it that you've installed facial recognition uh, software, the best in Ghana. Let's see it. Oh, no, let's go to Tamale. And where are the devices, even the very, uh, registration devices? Have you seen them yourself in the quantities that we approve for them? I'm not sure uh, about it. We want a free and fair election and not an electoral commission that is amenable to manipulation by the ruling government. And uh, we, we, we are worried about... Do you have about, any doubts of us having a free and, and fair election? We are, it's a process and systems will produce outcomes. Let's see what the system they are installing will uh, produce. So we cannot say exactly about the, the process until the process is complete. We Don't worry. We know even the electoral commission laying some cables. We are monitoring closely where the cables are going and where they end. What for you would constitute a free and fair election? And I say we are monitoring laying of cables between the electoral commission office and some other offices including even uh, closer to the presence of parliament here. As and when we want to come public, we'll come public with it. Honorable, let's go to Tamale South, where you're seeking, is it a fifth term? I should think so. Right. I should think uh, so. Why do you want to seek a fifth term after four to terms? Serve, to serve the people of uh, Tamale South. I'm not sure they are tired of me yet. Well, we have and to ask them to be sure. Go back to them. Uh, probably, without fear of contradiction, this would be my best resource in terms of parliamentary you mean the fourth? elections. Outcome. No, this election. Oh, you mean the December, fifth one? Will, will be my best, best, best Why do you say so? Is this some indication number, on the ground that you... I will get a number that I've never gotten before as MP. Are you a higher number or lower? Higher, higher, solid, solid number. I'm looking at 80,000. And I'm sure. 80,000 votes from Tamale yes, South. Yes, Tamale South. We'll I don't be referring think that... to it when the votes come in. Yeah, count it. Okay. Honorable, what but would I, you say I, I, I'm, is. I'm, is... I'm, I'm one of the privileged few who benefits from God's grace. My constituency is largely NDC. There is no MPP stronghold. I win almost virtually. You think that works to your benefit? Because every it historically polling, is NDC. Every polling station I win, and therefore. I don't panic like you do when people get out. You think the MPP stands a chance I'm of one, increasing its presence within the I'm one of out. the MPs who sleep very well with ease, that I only need to leave. You think the MPP will never gain footing within the South? elected member of parliament. They, I know of my vote. I don't know about MPP vote, so I don't discuss MPP. I take this election as if I'm running unopposed. 
Uh, there may be but other you, candidates. But you are not. Of, you always uh, have competition yeah, from but every side. My competition is not strong enough to be recognized. That's what you must appreciate. And uh, I've contributed immensely. Uh, one of the things I have failed, like every other MP, is addressing unemployment in the constituency. A lot you. of the able-bodied youth in Tamale are whipping my heart that I'm not able to help them to secure decent, what sustainable What is the plan? Let's say you go into the fifth term. I've, I've facilitated through advocacy some development of infrastructure, whether in health, whether in the provision of water, support for agriculture, and support for road and educational infrastructure. But it's not enough. Uh, still in Tamale South, I have challenges. I have this secondary oh, no, what, what road. What stopped you? <laughs> where, where unemployment is concerned. Victim secondary. I'm not government. I okay. say but government produce an enabling. Before. Yes, I recall. If you want to share that joke, when I became employment minister, a young lady sent me a text. I said, young man, and I said, oh, now that you are employment minister, I have my job. Mm -hmm. Regrettable employment ministers don't create jobs in Ghana. You see, you only lead a sectorial team to create the jobs. The Minister of Trade and Industry a is a creator. The Minister for Finance. I did my best. I mean, all this, uh, uh, I dealt with what you call the major incipient, insidious conflict, labor conflict, were addressed by me. That's why today there's stability in Ghana. There isn't threat to the industrial peace and harmony of the country. Matters of pension and second tier were addressed by me. Matters of, in fact, I've just read a recognition from the World Bank, and I smiled as I read it. I introduced the intervention where public sector-based pay was agreed to before budget. And that's helped the Minister for Finance to uh, leap ahead in terms of planning so and his budget preparation. I've just seen that in a World Bank publication 2015, which hails Ghana for that kind of uh, intervention. So you know what the rate of pay increase will be, which becomes a function of your compensation budget relative to your revenue ahead of time. It didn't used to happen. I introduced that 2014, 2015, 2016 before I left the uh, office. But I don't want to hear Nana the down coin about That's a good thing. You're working for, for you know, that's the job you're put in there to do. So now, everything let's in look Ghana at your term. So if you come into the free term, now that we've recognized the unemployment among the youth in Tamale South, it's one of the major issues. Is I there something you'll be tackling? I'm a advocate of it on the floor of parliament. I have a duty to reflect the needs the aspirations of the Ghanaian people. So it's not just member of parliament for Tamale South, but well, I, mirror, both roles. I mirror even the challenges of the Ghanaian private sector, whose bane is access to credit, the cost of credit. Let me just end it. For instance, this government again, go and deceive contractors that they're making two billion Ghana cities available. You read it, you published it. When we saw the supplementary budget, they spent about 780 uh, a, a billion, not two billion, so where is the rest of the money? Go and pay contractors. And just to end there, you see, it's sad. In Ghana, government creates a very bad future for our own contractors. It's only in Ghana that you do a is work a as contractor. You mean? No, it's, it's all both NDC and MPP. We have not helped the Ghanaian private sector, particularly contractors. I mean, we go to Rwanda. You don't award a contract when there's no budget for it. If you go to South Africa, so you would not make requests for payment, and after six months, you are not paid. In Ghana, there are still contractors who are owed 2014, 2015 certificate. How do you expect those contractors to survive? So they work for government, not for themselves, not for their families, and not but for But usually their the defense is that we it's need to the correct verified it. contracts. It's not about verified happy. contract. Just make money. We brought in ESLA, you remember, which increased the road fund, and we borrowed against it. They have also come to borrow against it. So what comes to the kit is not good enough to support contractors in terms of their outstanding obligations of uh, payment. But we need to decide as a country that don't award a contract when there's no budgetary provision for it. We need to get there. And then we need to get there as a country that know for every work done, it should not take more than six months to eight months for any person who has rendered service to government, whether as a contractor paid. or a service provider to get paid. We need to work at it. That's why we introduced public financial management legislation, but we're not there yet. 
I mean, you've seen the Minister for Finance, he's in breach of the deficit for 2019. Should we censure him? Now he came for forgiveness for 2020, but not 2019. Yet he tells you that he's a better, a good manager of the economy. We're not there yet. I mean, not an economy when you hide numbers and then put them at footnotes when the actual expenditure or you accumulate areas or you award contracts to yourself through other vehicles established by you. Honorable, I'm going to take you back to Tamale South because you also mentioned access to credit. Oh, Tamale South. My women They're your credit. people. Yes. They're exactly. <laughs> yes, uh, there are a lot of South. women in Tamale last South who night, are involved last, in last private night, businesses. Last night. You know there is some figures that came out I that say, Ghana is leading the world in women-owned businesses. And I say last night I was in Futa, I was in Pagaza, I was in Changna. You know. what, what should we expect and in access to How started, are you going to support women-owned businesses? I started my own micro credit initiative okay. which I give to my was constituents it? that are women and we roll out. Was this only for women? Yes, five hundred to a thousand Ghana cities. And you'll be amazed at the lives that that have changed. Uh, to share the joy of a husband, I went to a village at the Toile and a husband retorted that look Haruna, it's only when our women get your loans that we eat good soup at home. <laughs> so it means that it affects them but hopefully the, as, okay, as spouses. But it's, it's, so uh, is there a reduced interest rate home. that enables them? I didn't to, charge interest on the loans that okay. I gave. So I these are interest-free loans Muslim, to women businesses? Muslim, yeah, it was a Muslim kind of uh, loan. And finally, many of them have not been able to pay back. So recouping the money has become a I problem. I was wondering about that when you one talked the, about good soup. It's so. one of the things that I'm working at, microcredit for the women in my constituency. I think that mass lock has not been managed well, and uh, someday there will be accountability by all of us, including chief executive who think that they can take mass lock loans to go and win parliamentary primaries and then walk free. Honorable. Or you see people even just keep money on top of table. We're and going into 2020. Loans. You've been on... <laughs> Campaign. I'm very optimistic that John Dramani Mahama will win the 2020 <laughs> presidential election. Okay. We are targeting what, what 47, makes you optimistic? 47 additional parliamentary seats to constitute a majority. Okay, but, but what have you done differently between now and 2016 that gives you this optimism? Oh, I visited many consensus, some supporting the presidential candidates. Is it what the voters own. say that gives you this optimism? Sovereignty resides in the people. It doesn't reside in what Haruna thinks, so leave it to the Ghanaian people. What I do know that they will teach Nana Dunkwe and Dr. Bongwe a lesson come December 7th. Ghanaians are not quiet for nothing. Agreed. Between 2016 and now, what changes has the NDC made that makes you confident that you're going to increase your votes come 2020? It's to right some of our own wrongs and right Which some are? of the wrongs of the Nana Dunkwe government. You have to go sector by sector and policy okay. to policy. Okay. For me, for instance, I give you one. <laughs> when Nana Dudankwa announced free senior high school. If John Mahama was a shameless political opportunist, he too could have said that, okay, I'll do it, and ground the economy. He didn't do that. So you see Nana Dudankwa and the Dr. Bawia just taking advantage of political opportunism. When Mahama says Okada will legalize it, they say they will do it. When Mahama says that uh, salvage vehicles, I would review the law, they say they will do it. That's political opportunism. Oh, no, but you're once Minister of Trade. What should we expect in terms of industrialization when the NDC comes in? I think that Ghana is not there yet. My concept of an industrial Ghana was small-scale district rural industrialization initiative. But I look forward to a future where Ghana decides that, look, the government will acquire a piece of land, okay. extend water, extend electricity, extend IT, then you move in as so you, an entrepreneur. services the land. Absolutely. And then the entrepreneurs With move. ease. The cost is not you. You see, you want to so go into business. the cost of utilities are absorbed Absolutely. by government. Yes. You are afraid to go into business because of that. And then you go into light manufacturing. Now, agro-processing is one of our biggest advantage. Let me just share an example with you. The NDC started the construction of the Tamale Airport. Significant. Now, if you have a town or a city that there's no major port of entry, trade suffers, commercial activity suffers. If you produce, how do you get it out? How do you carry it out? So if you have a Tamale International Airport, 
it means the nature and character of agriculture will change in the next 10 years. If you can produce to export abroad, it takes seven hours to fly the horticultural products uh, out. Then you needed to develop irrigation facilities. Uh, we initiated the Tamil irrigation project. Now, we've been talking about I was going to expand it to Amate. You can go back as Minister for Trade. I said that major work be done on Kamba in the Upper West region, on Prim in the Central region, Amate in the Eastern region, region, Nasia Lemga Kli in the Volta region, Sabari Pagaza in the Northern region. And this have been promised in the NDC manifesto. And I believe that uh, John Dramani Mahama will do just that when he's re-elected as president of Ghana. But, you know, the typical Ghanaian would say promises are something we have heard so much of. What is there for us As to do? When you build a house with saliva, it, co it collapses with you. So don't worry about those who make juicy promises. Honorable, thank you so much My pleasure. for joining us My on pleasure. Spotlight. My pleasure. Thank you to our audience for joining us. If you're from Tamale South specifically, please get interactive with us. Uh, if you've been watching, get interactive. Uh, go to MX24GH on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube and leave us your comments. Thank you for staying with us. Join us again on Monday at 8.30. I am Nuong Falong. Good evening.